Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, welcome to our third presentation of the day. Uh, this is Marco Campana, and I'd like to share my introduction of him here. Um, over nearly 30 years, he has provided communications and digital services to the newcomer serving sector, from frontline client service to the first settlement.org content coordinator. He created and managed the Settlement at Work site, launching Ocasi's Learn at Work online learning site for sector workers, and has participated in a number of efforts to enhance sector knowledge mobilization. He led digital and social media strategy work at Maytree and currently works as a freelance consultant helping agencies harness technology in client service delivery. His current focus is on digital transformation, demystifying technology and social services and social change, immigration, diversity and inclusion, and he's based in Toronto. Uh, so welcome, Marco. Feel free to take it away whenever you're comfortable to do so. Thanks very much, and uh, and thank you for having me. Um, like others, I want to acknowledge that uh, while I'm in Toronto, I'm on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, this land is actually also part of the Dish With One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabek, and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the land, its waters, and all of the biodiversity in the Great Lakes region. And in this uh, unique system, law, society, and nature are considered equal partners in each place and important role. So as someone living on this land, I acknowledge my responsibility for honoring this treaty in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, is about promoting and sharing your work, mainly a focus on sharing, but really um, the idea of, so you're doing interesting work because we all are, and you're all content creators, you're creating curriculum, you're creating materials and useful resources all the time. So how can we get better about sharing that? So I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, some sector context when it comes to knowledge mobilization, uh, why we should care, why we should share our work why it matters, and what uh, some small steps, some actionable steps for you to take next, because uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming to, to try to get, uh, get, get your work out there. So some sector context, um, many of you have been part of some of the, a lot of the conversations and the research and consultations that have been done over the last couple of years, which really culminated um, in the National Steering Committee tech, uh, on Technology Reports uh, launched this April that looked at what are the priorities for our sector? And this is a this is a broad definition of the sector. So I come mainly from the settlement side, but this is inclusive of the language side as well. So uh, ESL instructors and organizations were included in these conversations, not just uh, settlement, and, and it kind of expanded from there. Pre arrival, um, you know, private sponsors, uh, government assisted refugee sponsors, and some of the things. At the bottom, uh, when we talk about mobilizing knowledge, which is a lot of what I'll be focusing on today, is what I consider kind of the inclusive umbrella that impacts the rest of um, the the prior. So by mobilizing knowledge, we can enable innovation. By mobilizing knowledge, we can strengthen what is becoming uh, defined as a hybrid service environment, or I think in the language side, it's been known for years as the blended uh, delivery. We also, by mobilizing knowledge and sharing our work, we can ensure and build on high quality and inclusive settlement services. So these are the priorities that we're working on, uh, that we've come to as a sector, um, that we're hoping will start to get operationalized uh, as soon as possible with IRCC and other funders support. Support, but they're also not new themes, and that's important to recognize. As other presenters have talked about, digital is not new. Our foray into digital is not new, and we've learned a lot over the years, um, which is really, again, kind of captured in the conversations, literature reviews, and additional research we've done. Where it dovetails is where IRCC's vision is, and this is something that came out of a presentation from about a year ago, their vision for digital settlement services. Now, their vision is is aligned in many ways with the sector's vision, but the language is interesting. So, for example, clients are able to access high quality settlement services and can opt to complement these things with in person offerings. A lot of folks in the sector would like to actually flip that language and talk about high quality settlement services in person and can opt for online offerings. And so, we really have to kind of talk through these kinds of priorities and negotiate that with with um, with our sector funders. But the reality is is that they are looking to support the continued digital transformation and. And to, to look at it from, from the lens of improved client outcomes and program effectiveness. So last year, they committed to doing some homework over this year and next um, to build an evidence base. And a lot of that is going to come from um, service de delivery improvement or SDI projects that they funded where they're experimenting, they're doing research projects. Some of you are working on some of these projects or have been part of the previous cohort of projects. There's a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge that will come out of those projects that we can apply to 
to uh, our work. Uh, and part of that is identifying these things like best or promising or good practices, in particular when it comes to digital literacy, cybersecurity, and privacy. And their goal, uh, although these conversations, uh, uh, to my knowledge, haven't totally happened yet in public with the sector, are to develop some guidelines and standards leading up to the next national call for proposals, which will be in 2024. So there's some big work that needs to be done. Um, and part of the way that they want to be doing that is around this notion of knowledge mobilization to really look at how do we build the capacity of the sector. So it's important that all the work that we're doing on digital is kind of framed within our own context and also the, the, the funders kind of vision for this and where we uh, where we intersect with that. But let's focus on why, why and, and where you should share your work. So why should you share the work that you're doing? And you're in, in e-learning, um, I, call, I talk about knowledge mobilization, but in the e-learning and education sector, the, the, there's the open educational resources idea, the idea that you're creating resources for others to be able to build on. And I think that's a really important um, foundation to be able to build on with when you're doing e-learning work. The idea about we're completing and not competing, right? Um, this comes out of... Um, uh, Alberta, actually, with Immigrant Services Calgary, where they've been working on some projects where they're looking at working more collaboratively across the sector. So instead of competing as agencies, we're completing each other's work or building on each other's work. We're making progress. We're not anticipating perfection in the work that we do, but we're sharing with each other so that we can build on that. And so you'll hear terms like open education resources, creative commons, crown copyright, public domain, or open licenses. And the idea behind all of these things is that you can share your work, still retain ownership and control over it, but give people different kinds of licenses in order to reuse, adapt, remix, and, and reshare uh, that, that information. So there's a foundation across the e-learning sector and a foundation across our own sector about, about sharing work. And one of the, um, the, the models that I quite like is coming out of the UK. It's called the Open Working Model, and they've created an actual toolkit that really breaks it down into... Um, actual practical steps. So this first step is to just start sharing, right? You don't have to share a lot, but you have to share consistently. The format that you share doesn't need to matter. We don't want to get sort of tied up in, should I do this on a Google Drive? Should I do it on, um, you know, in Teams or in Zoom or a webinar or a conference presentation? Um, the point is to start sharing what you're working on and to get it out there with other people and to protect the vulnerable, right? So when you're sharing, clearly we're not sharing client information or names or private information, but is to start sharing the work that you're doing and to be intentional um, to build, we build trust by what we're sharing, to not feel like you have to become someone else online. A lot of people are intimidated by sharing online because they're not confident in their, their, the materials they've created. They're not confident in their speaking ability. We see that in a lot of communities of practice, for example, in our sector, where people who work in the sector who um, are previous newcomers themselves, whose first language may not have been English, are not necessarily comfortable sharing. But let's share anyway, and let's be open and uh, and authentic with that, and be reflective. And as I'll talk about later, reflection takes time, and we don't always have or are given that time, but it's being intentional about reflecting on the work that you're doing as well as you're sharing it. Um, and as we've seen and talked about throughout today uh, is building relationships. So an opportunity to be on a live call like this is to connect and share with others. But we also have communities of practice like Tutela, like Avenue, like Settlenet.org across the sector, where you can share to get input, where you can share to get information, where you can build on others' work, and we're getting input from each other as we're building. And again, that is a difficult thing to do in our sector because we, you know, we we tend to be competitive. We tend to only want to share something when it's it's done and perfect and been polished. We don't share, uh, uh, you know, a half-baked idea or a half-baked model because um, we're afraid that we might get criticism. We're afraid that it might not be seen as complete enough. Um, but asking for input is a huge part of open working. There's a lot of trust involved with that. There's a lot of relationships around that. But the benefits of that is that you don't necessarily have to feel alone and you also don't have to create something that has been created before. So the stand on the shoulders is the idea of replication. Um, to avoid duplication. So maybe if someone has already been working on this, and if I share my half-baked idea, they can say, oh, we've been working on that for a while. Um, why don't we have a conversation and see how your work can continue or complement the work that we're doing, leveraging each other's work, reusing work from other people, as well as other people reusing work from, from us. So you can get access to, um, again, all of these links will be sent to you through the, uh, the um, 
the PDF of the presentation, but there is a, a, an online toolkit that you can kind of work through. There's also information here for funders about why they should fund open working. So I'm a true believer in the idea of information wants to be free, and so that anything that the government funds should be made available to everyone in the sector that it funds immediately after with Creative Commons, whether that's research, practical toolkits, entire videos, you know, you name it, no passwords, no, no nothing, but, but available immediately. And so it also walks you through um, some really simple steps about how to create an open working model for your own work um, and your organization, for example. And I think that, that making that commitment um, of open working can only benefit uh, us as individuals, as organizations, and the sector as a whole. And we see that time and time again, where somewhere in BC will create something that's Somewhere, someone in Nova Scotia will realize we have something complementary, and uh, and if we, sh we if we don't share it out in the open, those those matches will never happen, and instead duplication happens, um, which doesn't serve the sector at all. So here's an example that I've come across. This is an ESL instructor in Edmonton. I, I honestly don't remember how I, I got a hold of her newsletter, but I subscribed to her, her newsletter. It's a weekly newsletter. It's my Canadian English. Her name is Shona. And it looks like this. This is literally what she sends. It's a PDF. I don't always recommend sending PDFs, but whatever. She sends a PDF that includes a couple of links that take you to her YouTube page. And on her YouTube page, you simply see the grammar lesson in this case uh, of the week. Right, And she's made videos, they're shareable, and what she's done as well is she's created a website, mycanadianenglish.com, where all the videos are organized and easy to access. Now what's neat here is, as you'll notice, the site immediately changes, so My Canadian English redirects to a Google site. So there's a couple of things happening here. She's posting on YouTube, which is free. She's hosting on Google Sites, which is free. She's created, she's she's pay, probably paying 10 to $15 a year for that, that URL, mycanadianenglish.com, and then just set it up to redirect. So she isn't paying any website hosting fees for her videos, for her website itself. She's simply sharing information on a free, on a free spot. Subscribe, new videos every week, et cetera, et cetera. She's got a library of different videos here. So every week she's adding something, she's categorizing them. She's got her different lessons. She's got a certain kind of categorization in the work that she does. So like Linda had mentioned, categorizing your work, right? So basic vocabulary, um, Can Canadiana, um, adult literacy learners, things like that. And then she's uh, she's got new videos over here. Now, this takes a while to load because what she's done here is embedded a series of YouTube videos over and over again, basically. But what's interesting as well is when you think about subscribing to her mailing list, Similarly, she's she actually isn't using um, mailing list software. She simply, uh, once my computer connects, will eventually link you to signing up for a mailing list takes you to a Google form, which is yet another free tool. And all she's doing is literally sending emails out where she's blind carbon copying, BC seeing people. Now, you could, there's free versions out there of MailChimp and, um, and other simple uh, email newsletters that you can create. But what she's done is everything is tech low right? She's using technology that she probably uses as a teacher. So Google Sites, she's using um, videos on YouTube, which are free to upload and easy. She's creating, um, when you look at the videos, their narration over, t over slides. So she's either doing a screen capture or she's using one of the many tools that are out there. But the point is, is that she's taking um, her, her information and she's sharing it really quickly and easily. Okay, Donna says that you've collaborated with Shona on a few projects. Yeah, so she's uh, she's out there, so people know about her. And which is what what's neat about it is that the work that she's doing is uh, is is immediately shareable and possibly useful not just for end users but also for teachers. So, for example, if I'm looking for um, some video uh, 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 on grammar lessons categories of grammar. If this video works for, for, for me, I don't have to recreate it now. I don't have to build that video. I can simply reuse it. I can embed it into an LMS. And what you'll notice as well um, on her homepage, there's two things. One is it's on YouTube. And if it's freely available on YouTube, you can embed it wherever you want. But what she's also done is she's made her work licensed under a Creative Commons license. If you haven't seen this before, if you click on the link, Creative Commons still means, again, you maintain the copyright. But, but under this license, you as a user of her materials are free to share. So copy it anywhere. So take her YouTube videos, slap them into your stuff, and you can adapt. So you could download that video, re-edit it, but you have to give credit to her. 
and you have to put no additional restrictions. So for example, you can't then turn around and sell the videos. You have to use the same uh, license that she's used here, for example. So what she's done is she's made it freely available for everybody to use. And it's just, uh, again, it's part of her work. She's already doing it. Um, and she's created a way for, for people to access it that doesn't put a lot of re resource onus on her. In fact, very little in terms of cost. She's, if she's already making those videos for the work that she's doing, there's no additional cost to host them on, on YouTube, for example. So the idea is that technology has made it easier and easier to share, right? So. We can make it easy to access on all devices. So if we look at Google Sites, is is um, uh, mobile uh, mobile friendly? Sorry, the mobile responsive. So if you resize this site, it'll resize based on the device that you're looking at. The videos on YouTube play on all these kinds of devices. So she's made it easy to access on all devices. She's choosing the tech and tool that makes sense for her and for the people that she's sending it to. So we heard this a lot from from Allison um, and uh, and from, from Linda in choosing technology appropriately to make sure that it fits the needs and it works on all these different kinds of devices. And again, it can be as simple to get it out as, as an email uh, BCC like she's using. Or again, you can set it up. I, I use, for example, for my, um, my uh, I have a newsletter. I use Tiny Letter. It's actually created and owned by Mailchimp, but creating on here is much less onerous than going through the steps on Mailchimp. It's a scaled down version of a, of a uh, an email newsletter, and so it it does a little bit more than a BCC. Two things with when you're BCCing through email, if you have too many people, you might get tagged as a spammer. And here, people can actually sign up without having to go man. You don't have to do anything manually. They can sign, they can subscribe, and they can unsubscribe um, manually through here. Plus. Plus, you can actually end up with a um, with uh, an archive. Let me just see if I can remember. I'll figure it out in a sec. So that people can see um, previous uh, previous messages that you've sent before, for example. So again, it's really easy here. You uh, your design, your subscribe page, all of these kinds of things. So yeah, you end up with a with an archive of uh, of your previous. You end up with an archive of your previous messages as well. And so it's a little bit easier than sending them just through your email. But BCC works as well. So she's she's decided that's the way she wants to go. But the idea is that technology isn't the barrier anymore. It's about time, time to create, time to reflect. Time to create exists because you're already creating information that's out there. So why does it matter? There's a couple of reasons why I think sharing matters is to reach two categories of newcomers, but also to, with sector colleagues and peers. So when we talk about newcomers, we're talking about newcomers you're already working with, and by sharing with them in an asynchronous way, they become self-directed users of your work. So if the format allows, for example, if you're creating videos, they can come back to the materials. They may have gone through something in a live classroom and a recording of that is accessible for them after. But if you share publicly, it can also reach clients who are not necessarily aware of your work or unable to attend any of your classes or work. Uh, and it can scale and serve a broader population, right? So Shona's work is on YouTube. It's a it's a, it's on a public website. Any ESL or English learner can access those materials without restriction and can benefit from those materials by accessing it there. So even if they never interact with her, or take any of her classes, or pay for any of her services, they access those materials and they can learn from them. The other side is sharing with sector colleagues and peers. So I'm going to start with newcomers and give you some examples. So again, her, her site is an example, but Ties has some great examples um, of materials that other people have created. So these guides, um, my understanding is that um, they're submitted by volunteers and then they're categorized. So these are simple guides to a variety of different topics that are out there. Now you are creating, like e-learning e people are creating this Teachers are creating this all the time. You have all of these guides. You have all, all of these materials, um, whether your volunteers are creating it or you yourself are creating it. And adding it to a website, whether it's a website that has drop downs or a simple uh, Google Sites website, allows you to create content that people can access and make use of in really meaningful ways. There's also the idea of when you create something based on one project. So for example, Ty's created um, a, a series of, of modules to introduce newcomers to online classes. Um, what's it here? I see CLB3 and above. 
And what they've done is they've made it available for students who want to take the course, they can register, but they've also made the, them available as open educational resources free for other agencies to use. So I worked with a client where we contacted TIES, downloaded the, um, the modules because we're using Moodle as our LMS, and they've now put that into their system to use with their clients. Why should they create an entire new curriculum to introduce their clients to online cl classes when Nico has done it? Now, the benefit of some of this as well is that they can create whatever additional context they want to around that. So in some ways, it's like copy and paste into Moodle, right? Now there's a, there's a, there's a series of modules in Moodle that they can access, but because it's in Moodle, they can also customize them as much as they want. Maybe they want to replace one of the videos with their own video. Maybe they want to add some, some text at the beginning to provide a different context. Maybe they want to add module six at the end. Um, they can do whatever they want with it because it's now theirs in their LMS, for example. And there's a huge benefit to them because they don't have to create this. It's gone through a rigorous research and development process and been created by someone else. And they can make use of as much or as little of, of the materials as they want to in their own LMS, in their own work. So it saves them tons of time and potentially makes some connections for them with a group like Ties, who they may never have interacted with before to do further work in the future or to say, we want to do, you know, Nico version two. So we're going to go to the funder and we're going to ask Ties to, to come in on it with us because they're clearly the, the developers of this, but we have identified a need. So instead of trying to replicate or duplicate something, they're now leveraging what has been created, use it and build on it um, on, uh, in, in future work as well. So those are some examples of, of using with, with newcomers. Um, why does it matter with sector call? And, and again, there's tons of good examples of these kinds of um, free and open um, sites that are out there that make use of this. The question is around um, pulling it together and not doing that kind of duplication. So sharing matters with sector colleagues and peers on, th on, on a number of different levels. One is to share, for example, like Nico, the kinds of curriculum that you've created. So eSkills has created an entire um, downloadable uh, courseware related to cybersecurity, um, right? If you're using Moodle, you can download it. If you're using uh, D2L, uh, Brightspace, you, you can download their materials. If you're interested in helping people understand security, protecting their online identity, browser basics, advertisements versus content, you once again, you can get their materials, put it into your Moodle, and then customize it however you want. You don't need to recreate it. Similarly, Norquest College has created WebSafe um, as, uh, as SCORM modules, I believe. So these are modules that you can actually access right here. So if I wanna access this as a course, I can simply provide this link to, um, to my learners. Welcome to WebSafe, start the course, and I'm off and running. Or as it says here, you can, um, you can contact them and get the, the package itself. And, and add it to your, to your own LMS. So similarly, I did this with my client as well. We got access to all of these units and we said, which are the ones and how do we want to introduce them? Because maybe module one to three is too much. So maybe we create course one, course two, course three. Again, you can you can lay it out however you want because it's a it's a SCORM package. You can also surround it with as much or as little additional context as you want. It's something that's been created already. You can take a look at it right here. If you're if you're helping people find a job online, why reinvent the wheel, right? Why not take what someone else has created and, and is making available um, for people? Again, it talks about newcomers at CLV four plus. So there's some there's some nice wayfinding there to help you understand where it would be useful. So other organizations are creating materials and they're making them available for you and you can do the same. And where, where are they sharing them? So Tutela and Avenue are great examples. So I like to look at Tutela. Actually, I'll look at the next, the next slide. Tutela is a great example. A lot of people have mentioned it already where people are sharing. It's your community of practice as is Avenue. And I know that they're working more closely together now, but learning events like this conferences are another great place to showcase and talk about the work that you're doing. Like the presentations here, there are many, many types of, um, of conferences, formal and informal. And because we have the technology, there's nothing stopping you from simply saying, I would like to share what I'm working on. 
send out a Zoom link to 15 people and say, meet me and let's talk about this. I have a regular monthly meeting with a number of people doing interesting work on digital literacy. We have a small email list of 35 people and about 10 to 12 of them show up every month. And we have a one and a half hour conversation about the work that we're doing. Does anyone have a call or a need for participation? Does anyone want to go in with someone else on funding, et cetera, et cetera. And what it does is that we just informally get into the rhythm of sharing with each other. There's no pressure of presenting at a conference. You don't have to have slides, but you can if you want to, but you regularly just throw out a link and say to people, let's have a conversation, or maybe you just do it formally in your own networks, for example. Even more formally are some of the um, the, the, the journals that are out there. So TESOL Canada, uh, the Computer Assisted Language Learning Journal, uh, and sites like Learn IT to Teach, who manages Avenue, also maintains a bibliography of learning. So you can come here and look for the latest research. You don't need to be curating or finding this research yourself. You know, they're looking at adult settlement blended language learning bibliography. So every now and then, you know, in September 27th, they added a new, a new, um, a new interesting uh, article, the computer assisted language learning. I love this because this thing has been around since 1990. Okay. If we, if you look back at all, all volumes and issues, scroll, 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 1990, this is not a new conversation. And I love this one. I clicked on issue one, the very first article. Exploiting information technology to develop language and life skills. Not a new conversation, right? So lots of really interesting thoughts. So maybe you collaborate with, with, uh, with an academic or a researcher, or you simply use this to learn what's happening in your field and to build off of what's there and then connect with people who are doing this kind of similar work to say, hey, we're actually working on something similar. Um, so if we went to the latest article, let's see what's happening just off the top of my head. Uh, how does emoji feedback affect the learning effectiveness of e EFL learners? You know what? We're looking at some of that in our, so I'll, con I'll connect with these researchers to find out more. What it helps you do is to find other people doing similar or interesting work from a research perspective. So on to Tutela. So just at a, at a quick glance, one of the things around replication that you can see right away is there's 267 H5P resources. There are 780 uh, SCORM resources right at a glance. You can, you can further those themes. You can, you can look at different levels. But what it gives you, and I know that you know this already, but I think it's important to reinforce. So for example, oh, I'm doing a unit on, Canadian, on Canada's Indigenous peoples. I wonder what's been done here. So this has been created by, funded by IRCC, created by the Toronto Catholic District School Board, three modules with a guide. And because it's in an M5, H5P format, you can download and you can replicate this right away. So just to sort of play with it, um, let's see if I can find where I left it. Sorry, one second. Oh, yeah. So here's an H5P. on. So I took that H5P and I put it on my website. Right. So now I've put it on a blog. This is not a, you can put it on LMS. It's a no brainer, but you can put it in other places as well. And then as I've written here, I can put some introductory material framing the topic, how to navigate this, what this is all about. And then I could maybe put a poll or a survey or a Google form where I could ask people to reflect on it. So I can surround this with my own materials within an LMS or elsewhere. I can also put it onto a Google site. So this is it embedded on a Google site. Now, what's nice here is with Google sites is this is just a preview, you can see it's showing it what it looks like on a large screen, what it'll look like on a tablet, and what it'll look like on a smartphone. So it renders nicely. It's 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 mobile responsive. One of the things that I saw when I was editing, uh, when I did it on a large screen, I hadn't made the box around this large enough, so it got cut off. I'll show you what I mean by that. So on, if you haven't used Google Sites, you can sort of, so this looks fine here, but when I preview it, Looks fine on my large screen, looks okay on my tablet, but gets, gets cut off on my phone. So it tells me immediately they have to scroll, not just on the page, but within the H5P as well. So I, all I have to do is come back here, click on it, expand this a little bit, preview it again. And now you can see there's page scrolling, but there isn't scrolling well, there's a little bit, but they can see everything that's here. So the other thing about if you're creating H5P resources is something at the bottom here, right? Reuse, rights of use, and embed. We don't always see that on H5P. Reuse is allows me to download this as an H5P file. 
do that every single time. Let people download your H5P uh, files. Sh fill out the rights of use to let them know that this is under a Creative Commons license and they can use it in this way. So for example, in this case, it has an additional share alike. And I'll show you what, simply what that means is that if I, let's say, adapt and remix it, I have to tr I have to share it back out using the same license. So let's say I take that H5P, I pull it into Lumi or another H5P editor, and I share it back under my um, my LMS or something like that. I have to then reshare it either back to Tutela or just in general. Um, uh, in different places. You can also make it embeddable so that someone doesn't necessarily need to download it. But as you can see here, it's pulling it from this website where I did the initial uh, embed, the KM4S, which is my knowledge mobilization for settlement. Don't worry about that. Um, and now it's, Im it's embedded here because you can't always embed H5P, but you can uh, you, so you can't always upload, like, for example, I don't think I can upload an H5P to Google Sites, but if it's somewhere else, I can embed it through this iframe source into a Google Site. So again, the use of the technology and how we are intentional about how we want to share it makes it more or less accessible to other people um, in, uh, in, in our networks and in our abilities to share. So again, I've highlighted it here, but, you know, there's tons of resources, tons of SCORM um, modules uh, and uh, and units that you can use and reuse. So we want to look at and contribute to these repositories instead of necessarily creating. So if I was you know looking for um, Canadian uh, sorry information once again on Indigenous people for CLB three four, I would start here. I would see what someone else has created, and then I would build on it, and then I would share it back and let the people know who who created the original, how I used it and how I built back. That's that sort of community part again. That's building, standing on the shoulders of others, but then you know, replicating and leveraging and building on it. So maybe by the end, there's a resource that has six modules because we've all contributed to something together. There was a nuance that I felt was needed, so I added to it, but I didn't have to create the first three of those modules. I could simply build on them. And so the, the, the sort of the lesson behind all of this is that technology and content is increasingly becoming complex, but it's also becoming easy, right? It's that sort of YouTube has raised and lowered the bar of expectations for video production. It's raised the expectations because video is so easy, right? You grab your phone, you, you create a selfie video, you slap it up onto YouTube, but it's also lowered the expectations when it comes to the, the sort of quality of that video. You don't need fancy little intros and outros and, uh, and special uh, devices um, and, and music and things like that. You can simply be a talking head. It, what matters is the quality of the content and that they can hear you in that video, right? And then you can just use H5P to make it funky by adding, you know, things throughout where you're asking questions and stuff like that. But what sharing does is that it helps rise above that cacophony of noise of technology so that we are not necessarily feeling so isolated and that we have to create this on our own, but that we're building in a community together. And I think that's something that's really important important and really valuable. So what should you do next? Small steps, right? Just start. I'm showing this again. This is the open working manifesto. You all have digital content. So I'm talking to you. I'm talking to people who might be watching this recording. I want you to pass this on. Take one item a week and commit to sharing it in some meaningful way. You don't have to start sharing everything, right? So Shona sends up a weekly email and there's usually two to three videos. And she says, here's what's coming up next week. She could send one video. Um, she could be putting, you know, you could be putting on your organization's website. You could simply create a YouTube channel. You can create a Google site. You can do something free and easy now with the knowledge you already have and the resources you already have access to. And you can simply share a PDF of uh, this week's most interesting lesson plan, the one that resonated the most with your clients. You can repurpose or, or, or create something that would be useful for, you, for your clients. You can share that in a meaningful way. And then share that with other people to let them know that you've done that, whether it's in the Tutela, whether it's through an email list, whether it's just with your colleagues within your own organization or your own personal network. Just commit to sharing one thing a week. Imagine by the end of the year, you'll have 52 really interesting things that you've shared, and it just cascades. And if five of you in your organization do that, you'll have five new pieces of content a week. You'll have over 250 new interesting pieces of content every week that you've shared in some meaningful way. And all of a sudden, 
we're building on each other's work instead of re uh, replicating. I talk about this in the settlement sector all the time. If everyone stopped writing how to write a resume and everyone just collaborated on one version of how to write a resume, maybe other people could talk about other labor market kinds of, of things. Uh, we, could, we could expand and move forward in the discussion, for example, um, and move beyond what... Um, what what we're already working on so someone mentioned that's the sort of things our funders are also are, are always asking to do which does lead me though to the conversation about leadership because the one thing that the funders say is we want you to collaborate we want you to partner we want you to um to share your knowledge but they do not provide the time to either do that or the reflection time in order to uh, analyze and figure out what the right stuff is and so we need to figure that out and figure that leadership out in our own organizations in our own sector what does it look like and that's why i'm being really clear about one thing a week right otherwise it just gets too overwhelming um, you know, just talk about the stuff you're doing, as they say, this is from the, the open work project, you already are talking about this stuff, it's already something you've created, no one's creating, it. you know, predominantly not creating paper based resources, you're creating something digitally already, whether it's a Word document, an H5P, a SCORM, a PDF, you know, no matter what it is, simple, small steps is what we need to do. Then we need to be advocating within our organizations and with with our funders to actually fund that kind of findability, the next steps of, if I'm contributing to Tela, that takes some extra time, right? I have to go into that system and I have to categorize things and I have to upload them in a certain way. It shouldn't just be organizations like that, um, like this project from the Toronto Catholic District School Board with funding, with the expectation that it would be shared here, but it should be everybody is being funded and given the time to reflect, to build on other people's work, and also to share effectively across the sector. So we need to be advocating for that, but I think we can start with those very small steps. Uh, it's not too overwhelming. There's a lot of really good work that, that people are doing out there, and they can share it quickly and easily. And that is my pitch to you. So I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, hopefully we can have a bit of a conversation on some of this stuff. Yeah, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, Marco, I actually had a few for you. Oh, Donna has a question. Donna. <laughs> um, hi, yeah. So I work at the at TIES in the Literacy Center of Expertise, and our whole mandate is to share and develop and create community based around um, literacy, specifically for literacy learners. But um, one thing I found when I was a brand new teacher was going out and looking for stuff that was available. It was overwhelming to me. Yeah. And, and uh, I know they're trying to correct this, but on Tutela, nothing was refereed, nothing was dated. So I, as a new teacher, look at this and think, well, it's on, you know, the government funded page. It must be good. I'm going to use this and find out it's like seven years old and, and not really, um, following the rules that I'm supposed to follow now. Yeah. So, you know, these five things a week, who who's refereeing or curating or because I don't know that teachers really have time to do any of that if if we're going to look at the the role of the teacher. For sure. Uh, on Tutel, I've noticed that, for example, they've got this green check mark now that that shows that the new re the resource aligns with PBLA and CLB. That's based on a self-assessment, I know, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of that that we have to build in some some trust and professionalism with those expectations. There is a lot of trust when we're sharing. Um, but that's why I talk about the need for time to reflect and the need to, for the time to analyze. Because if you're looking at a resource, you have to be able to have those kinds of, um, you know, they call it crap testing, right? Is this current, reliable, authoritative, and what's the perspective or what's the bias, right? You have to be able to do that really quickly, but the system should be able to, to, to essentially um, make that front and center for you. So like you said, is it seven years old? Is it CLB aligned, at least according to the uh, the instructor? Ideally, ideally, these communities would actually have staff who do those assessments. The problem with our funders is that they believe that communities of practice um, are inherently self-directed. And of course, they sort of are, but there is a role to play for, as, as Linda called it, content curation, moderation, facilitation, assessment, evaluation. There's a 100% center role for for, 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 to, for that to exist. The ideal tutela would be that people are submitting materials 
and they don't show up until they've been they've met a certain requirements a certain checklist by the site moderators now that requires resources in the interim until we convince our funders of of the importance of that we're self-moderating and we have to self-assess and to be able to do that effectively absolutely does require time and it was one 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 piece of content a week not a day just to be clear because i'm trying to make it easy right um and so yeah, that, that there are those sort of systemic or institutional challenges to some of this. And that's why the other part of it is the community, the constant conversation, the ability to say, I created this, and I believe it, it works for CLB three to four, and here's why, and here's how you can use it in your work. So being able to kind of expand, not just throwing stuff onto a site, but the site asking you questions like that, right? So I'm just trying to see, so for example, in the description on, uh, on something like the unit on Indigenous peoples, um, there are places for the the authors to comment, right? So they can say, uh, "We created this. It with, with it's with funding." That tells me a little bit something about about the, the the reliability, perhaps. Toronto Catholic District School Board. What do I think about that institution from an ESL perspective? It's CLB three four. Um, you know, there's more information that other people can. And then I go to the comments, right? You know. What are other what are people saying about this? Was it crap? Was it useless? Can I give a like what's the Yelp for content, right? It needs to be quick, thumbs up, thumbs down, but people are making contents, right? Note that for the first activity in slide seven has a small problem really useful but then what's the accountability for someone fixing that now the nice thing is is because at h5p i can download it and i can fix it myself and then i can put it back to tutela but that's perhaps a lot to offer so we have again a different number of ways to kind of look at the authoritativeness and usefulness of it based on what the community response might be um but uh but but ideally yes ideally we want to work towards a system that actually has some some uh not gatekeepers, but some some quality keepers, if you will, some quality assurance. Um, for now, that's us as individuals, and so we can only do the best we can. But uh, it's a really important point. So that's why, again, I say try to keep it simple, be self-reflective, but be explanatory when you're, you're sharing the materials as well. Astrid, I, I think in I think in principle, the sharing is is really great. Sorry, can you pull your your uh, microphone down? Okay, sorry. I think um, in principle, like the sharing is really great, um, but like each thing requires a new tech navigation. And, you know, like in our busy schedules, like, I mean, if you show a model of a, like a website with videos embedded in it, or even uh, mail out with, I mean, I think it would be good to have, if we want to build this kind of sharing community, it would be good to have um, maybe a central website with tools for how you could share and tech videos to walk you step through, step by step through how to build that website to share or how to, even YouTube, like what are all the questions for our, our like, we all have questions as we load to YouTube. Is it? Is it? Do I want to put my videos as public? Do I want to keep them as unlisted? I think if we if we want to have this sharing community, we need to build a tech resource team for our sector 100%, that 100%. answers some of these questions. Because otherwise, we're instead of um, we're sharing the resources, but we're not sharing that tech skill which we need to share the resources they completely agree. and that's so in, just like yeah we can't invent it every time it takes so much time to figure out right absolutely yeah i know in some ways learn it to teach and the, and the avenue folks were supposed to be part of that in ontario there's a group called alpha plus which works with the literacy community to do exactly what you're describing and some of the recommendations we've made is for the creation of something like that now i've been in the sector long enough that in um in 2000 or actually 90 98 99 the ontario settlement sector was completely connected to the internet and wired and that's when settlement.org was launched and what they did was they actually created a system where each organization had someone who was half-time funded to be um uh, ten, a technical liaison and that person was responsible for working on technology within the they could be a settlement counselor who just had some tech chops and decided they wanted to split their job or it could just be a whole new half time and they were there for at the time what was sort of basically technical troubleshooting and then there was a third party organization that was contracted when you escalated so if it was out of the the competency of that person they then would go to that third party and then there was settlement.org as a landing place for content to share with newcomers and 
And then there was an extra net, which is um, what SettleNet is today, which was a community of practice. Now, what that looks like is what we need today is exactly that funded resources at the organizational level who can help. So the digital navigator, right? Um, uh, you, you called it different, diff something different, the digital assistant, I think at Mosaic, but this is the evolution of new roles that we see in organizations. Digital navigators are required for both onboarding newcomers to technology, as well as supporting um, staff in the use of that technology. Now that doesn't, that's not just something that needs to be a centralized resource, that needs to be at, at the agency or regional level. So some threshold where if you have X number of funded staff or more, you get a, a half-time digital navigator. If you've got even more, you get a full-time one. If you're under that, then you get a floating digital navigator who goes to different agencies, maybe supported by local immigration partnerships, something like that. But the idea that there needs to be, and this is sort of, again, that model of where we're heading to for the next call for proposals, what are the new roles that we we've seen are essential during the pandemic that can have that have to become essential. So a lot of organizations, in particular in the language side, had these digital assistants or digital navigators. In fact, some still do, like at iSANS, there's, I think, two funded digital navigators, probably funded by the province because they tend to get it more but that, that are actually on staff to do exactly what you're describing. Oh, you've got a question? Okay, I'll go figure it out and then I'll come back to you with the solution so you can just continue teaching, right? So 100% what you're describing needs to be put in place. We've seen examples of that both in our sector and in other nonprofit sectors. Um, and, uh, and, and we just need to make sure that they're built into um, the funding in the same way that Tutela needs to have a few more people to help with the kind of content curation. And you need layers of it. It's not just the digital navigator for the students or clients or teachers, but even for us, like if I'm a developer of content, I like there's still like, yeah. there's so much. Oh, no, it's layers. so it's, much tons tech of learning that. Yeah, there is. And so there's new roles. But then as I as I as I mentioned in earlier in the chat, like digital navigator, we're all digital navigators now in some to some degree, right? We're all these technical liaisons. So teachers or settlement workers are the front line for the questions a student or a client might have about, yeah, this 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 app, this this LMS, this WhatsApp, this message, it's not working for me. They have to do low level tech support, but they have to have someone they can escalate that to either on site or somewhere else, because we can't expect frontline and or instructional designers or teachers to be tech uh, experts at the same time. So there's it's nuances and it's degrees of 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 what we need to expect of people um, in terms of their skill sets as as well as what they need to be able to sort of escalate to in, within the organization or outside of it. But yeah, there's tons of nuances in all of this in the different roles for sure. And uh, and as you said, like with the conferences and stuff and the ability to share and with these tools itself, like this kind of conference is already new. So I guess it's an appreciation for where we've come to. Yeah, it's not because new though, like right? we've, we've, we've come somewhere too, right, to be this able to do this now. Right? I'm, I'm going to push back yeah. because it's not new. It's it's 30 years old, right? People have been talking yeah. about and used this technology forever. It's new to us because a lot of us were forced into it. It's not new in the language sector, for sure. It's not new in the settlement sector. Mosaic talked about, I think, 2009, um, that, that, that you've been using technology. Well, iSense has been doing it since 2007. Um, you know, Costi in Toronto has been doing it since 2000 and what, 13? I mean, there's, there's just like so much that's been done, but what we don't do is share it and then replicate it, right? So if you think about settlement pre-arrival online, that is ISAN's system on a pre-arrival scale scaled across the country with different providers. Finally, we did something right. We didn't just try to reinvent the system. We looked at it and said, hey, your system works well. Maybe we should replicate that in a few other places and see how that works. Um, it's uh, even even like online meetings and things like that. These aren't new. These are new to us in some ways, but they're not new technologically. They've just become easier, right? They've just become faster and simpler and more stable. And I think that that's something that's really important to point out. There's tons of lessons we can look back and learn from, which is, again, what, what we've done in some of the research. This is a 20-year-old conversation in our sector in terms of like hardcore research. And I like to joke that every five years or so, IRCC funds another set of research that says basically the same things. Do it, but fund it correctly, support the sector. And then they're like, okay. And then five years later, they ask for the same research to be done. Now, pandemic was supposed to be a game changer around this. So in theory, like I showed you, they are talking about now a vision for digital digital service delivery. We are not sure where that's at yet, but it has to come with investments and it has to come with baselines. And that's baselines in infrastructure, 
uh, baselines and competencies, baselines and abilities, as well as baselines and time for that kind of knowledge reflection and sharing, for example. So not a new conversation, but one that we're hoping will finally actually get some steam and move forward with. Because as, as your, your colleague pointed out, this whole digital thing isn't new just to our sector, right? Um, it's a digital economy. Newcomers are coming in and need to be ready um, to be able to work in the digital sphere, to bank in the digital sphere, to access digital and virtual health, for example. And so we have a, a role to play when it comes to not just sharing content, but digital inclusion, digital equity, all of those pieces as well. Sorry, I could rant on about this stuff forever, um, but maybe I'll take some more questions instead. Yeah, does anyone have any other questions? I have one, Jeremy, if you don't mind, Marco. It's a great presentation. I think you described the ideal world of sharing for us. Just based on your experience and uh, what is your suggestion? Uh, my question is very similar to Astrid's question. So and have a you know central website or central database to share the resources, but uh, who do you think need to be in charge of this central shared place? Funder, SPOs or consultant? What oh, is the best SPOs, be SPOs, of course, not cons Oh God, no, don't give it to consultants. The funder should fund it. Consultants should be consulted when necessary to, to provide whatever is needed, whether it's tech development or other things, but it needs to be owned and driven by the sector. I mean, Tutela in theory is your home right now, right? It should be the place where all of this stuff happens. And if it's not um, meeting the needs, then that needs to be kind of worked on and figured out. But the sector, you know, in the same way that Settlenet has been created for the settlement side of the sector as a community of practice. And right now it's not meeting everybody's needs. So what do we need to do as a sector to move that forward? If we just try to hive off into separate communities of practice, all we're going to be doing is that whole divide and conquered approach, right? If you have something that exists and, and, and is doing the job, how can we improve it? needs to be owned by the sector, needs to be funded um, over the long term and committed to funded by, by, by the funder and, um, and consultants and tech support and developers need to be brought in when necessary, which in a technology space is you know frequently, right? You, you don't just build it, you continue to develop it, you tweak it, you improve it, you learn from your users and you, uh, you, uh, you make it better. Um, and sometimes you switch the technology entirely when when there's new technology that can do what you're trying to do better. And that's you know that's a legitimate sort of thing to do. But that um, that needs to be owned by the by the uh, the sector, I suppose. Absolutely. I'm thinking about how to maintain it. So if it's owned, you know, and taken care of by individual. SPO, how to get the long-term funding? Is what I mean. No, not by an individual. It needs to be owned. I mean, sector. It's a collaborative approach, right? Obviously, one organization is gonna is gonna run it, but it needs to have the governance infrastructure to be responsive and uh, and receptive to the sector, so that it's driven by the sector, right? So again, I don't know what Tutela's framework is, but the Settlenet uh, governance structure has you know the heads of all the major uh, umbrella organizations and a few individual uh, large service providers that are driving the governance of that, um, and so you want to have a model that has accountability for sure to the sector, yeah. Thank you, Marco. Robert, yeah. Thanks, Marco. It's a really informative presentation. Um, I just had a question with regard to content, uh, content development, um, open source, and kind of being paid for that work or or to, to be, because um, a lot of a lot of the content that that we can share now has has been created by payment for a different service or for a particular project, and then let's share that now with with our community so where do you see that balance of if there's content that's required or needed in the community um you know getting getting somebody to to pay for that 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 content development and then being able to amplify that and share that with the community yeah i mean most of the content development happens through government funding or through other 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 kinds of funding and so the organization has to itself and and the project people have to themselves be committed from the get-go to some form of open sharing right whether it's open educational resources or creative commons or whatever the case might be the funders also the funders have to recognize that what they're funding needs to also be shared so that you know you were talking about that conversation with government funders understanding what open working means uh, you know in our sector those investments still need to come from IRCC and other other levels of government, whether it's provincial, federal, municipal, you know, um, foundations, 
uh, even crowdfunding, right? If even if you're if you're crowdfunding or you're getting corporate sponsorship, um, you know, again, the organization should be committing to sharing those resources out openly. After is is what I believe. Not everybody believes that, but I think that's what's important um, because it's that's the only way we can move forward collaboratively. Um, so I think that 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 has to be kind of a baked in commitment. Um, groups like IRCC can bake that right into their contracts. Is that this will be shareable after? Um, so that's. That's kind of a no-brainer um, at this point. It's 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 contractually possible to do that. I don't know if that helps. If that answers your question. Yeah, and then how how do you kind of keep tabs as to where that content ends up? And um, you know, if, with open source, some of the some of the pushback has been well, other people are adapting it and charging for it and um, amplifying it. And, that and happens everything. if you have complete copyright over something already. So that's to me, that's a non-starter argument. It's the same. It's the same thing that I hear from the settlement sector. Oh, if we give all our information away, people won't come and access our services. And my pushback to that is, one, I can take whatever you do right now if I get my hands on it, and I can reuse it however I want, and you'll never know about it. Right? If we, as a sector, commit to open. We at least are committing to amplifying and you know uh, acknowledging that you created it and then sharing back how I might have remixed or adapted it. People will always abuse that. That's not a reason to not to, to, to do it. In the same way that I say to settlement organizations, if the only reason people are coming to you is for a resume template that you don't want to share publicly, then you suck at your services. Right. That's not that's not a service. I can go on the web right now and I can download 500 different resume templates. Um, you know, I, I can get them from anywhere. That's why people aren't coming to you for service delivery. Your role is to help them understand the Canadian context of creating that resume, why they shouldn't attach a picture to it or talk about their family or whatever the case might be, and then to move them through a job search delivery process. It's the the additional value add that you bring. It's not just you know content. It's why settlement.org never replaced any settlement services because it's full of content, but people need the next step, which is a human interaction of how do I use this to further my career? get my kid into school, act, find a doctor, you know, all of those kinds of things. So will people abuse things? Um, they already do. So I'm personally not quite worried about that because in an open system, I'd rather have people sharing and maybe it ends up somewhere, but you know, but it already, it already does now. I can download a video from YouTube and put it wherever I want, right? The technology to do that exists. It's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's a, to me, it's, I don't mean to be dismissive, but I don't think it's a, it's an argument that that, that we should be focusing on because I think that it's it's happening already with with actually copyrighted content that uh, that we're not giving people permission to reuse. And I think that the problem with doing that is if we keep it hidden, then we then we lose all of the other aspects of the open side of things, right? Like right now there's a conference happening at Metropolis, right? That if you're not there, you have no access to the materials. And you might see some PowerPoint slides after, but you they don't record the 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 the, the videos and things like that. That's a heavily funded government funded uh, conference. Everything that happens at that conference should be recorded and shared after. It's absurd that it's not. And the fact that we've come out of the pandemic and gone right back to the way we did things is ridiculous, right? Like it, it doesn't make any sense. Well, thank you, Marco. That's hugely inspiring, honestly. <laughs> uh... Sorry to end on that note. <laughs> No, no, no. If there was some sort of office we could elect you to, I would be, I would be sending you right up there, but uh, maybe that's a project <laughs> for another time. Um, Listen, thank you. information this wants to be free, so let's let it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, that it's a really good point about Metropolis, right? We have co-workers right there right now. I'm sure we all do. And is it, what is it that they're learning? What sort of stuff will they be able to bring back to us? Like, yeah, Hopefully no you'll have a lunch and learn after and, and you can at least get some of it, but right you know. but that shouldn't even be necessary right we should no. be able to either just dial right in or it should be something we can do on our own time on the couch and some sweats so yeah a, a lot a lot to think about there thank you so much thank you for um, having I, me i appreciate it everybody yeah this is wonderful um we're going to take just about a four minute break here uh, just to let donna and jeremy uh, get uh, prepared for their uh, next presentation on hybrid delivery they're going to be starting at one o'clock uh, so take a short break and we'll be right back thank you